presents Hollywood. Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Quakes, bring you the Lux Radio Theater, starring Olivia de Havilland and Richard Basehart in The Corn is Green. Greetings from Dallas, New Mexico, ladies and gentlemen. Even though I am a few hundred miles away directing a motion picture, the Lux Radio Theater is in Hollywood as always. And tonight, we proudly present one of the finest actresses in the history of the American screen, Miss Olivia de Havilland, in the distinguished drama, The Corn is Green. Our play tonight, the Broadway stage success by Emlyn Williams, gives Mr. Havilland an opportunity to combine her great artistry with a great role. And appearing with her is the promising new star, Richard Basart. The Corn is Green is the story of a school teacher who finds a student with a great future and then is almost defeated in her efforts to educate him for the future by a very simple obstacle, the human need for love. You know, today's teachers, like many others, have something of a budget problem. And, of course, that's always a good opportunity for Lux Flakes. Every woman who runs a home these days, whether it's a full-time or a part-time occupation, needs to manage efficiently. Even on a small budget, Lux Flakes provide safe, dependable washing care that's thrifty, too. And now, here's The Corn is Green, starring Olivia de Havilland as Miss Moffat and Richard Basehart as Morgan Evans. The Welsh countryside, some 50 years ago, an obscure village called Glensarno. There's an old house in Glensarno, long empty. And on this spring afternoon, the new owner has just arrived. So I trust you will find everything in order, Miss Muffat. I will go now. No, no, please wait, Mr. Jones. You too, Miss Rondre. Oh, I do thank you both. From what I can see, you've arranged my things splendidly. But I want very specially to talk to you. He... Yes? Excuse me. Are you saved? I beg your pardon? Are you church or chapel? I really don't know. Anyway, I... What is that singing? The voice coming home from the mine. Oh, he burst into song in the slightest provocation. You mustn't take any notice. It's beautiful. The mine. Coal, is it not? It is coal. Three miles over the hill. I see. Now... Before Mrs. Watty gets here... Mrs. Watty? My housekeeper. She and her daughter are coming from the station with my baggage. Now, tell me, what's that large empty building next door? It is the old farm belonging to the Gwalior farm, before the farm was burnt down. Then it's for rent or for sale? I would think so. But, but what is that to do with, with you, Miss Ronbury? I will tell you. We have mutual friends in London, Miss Ronbury. They have told me that you live alone, you have just enough money, you're educated... And time lies heavy on your hands. Oh, how horrid of them. But isn't it so? Well, not at all. When the right gentleman appears, I shall... If you're a spinster, Miss Rondry, well on in her thirties, that right gentleman is not coming. He's lost his way. <sighs> so why don't you face the fact and enjoy yourself, as I do? But a woman's only future is to marry and... And... But haven't you ever been in love? No. Oh, how very odd. I've never talked to a man for more than five minutes without wanting to box his ears. Which brings me to you, Mr. Jones. My conscience is as clear as the snow. I'm sure it is. The Wingroves told me all about you, too. But you're a disappointed man, aren't you? How can I be disappointed when I'm saved? Oh, but you can. You're frustrated, Mr. Jones. So you fall back on being saved. Am I right? It is such a terrible thing you have said. But I will have to think it over. Do. But in the meantime, would you two like to stop moping and be very useful to me? Useful? How many families are there around here? Thirty families in the village and fifteen in the farms around. Many children? Children? Here they are only children until they are twelve. Then they go to work in the mine and in one week they are old men. How many of them can read and write? Next to none. Why do you ask? 
Because I am going to start a school for them. A school for them? But what for? What for? Do you see these books, Miss Wambury, which you were kind enough to unpack for me? Hundreds of them. And something wonderful to read in every single one. These nippers are to be cut off from all that forever, are they? Why? What a school for... For ordinary children? Oh, when I heard this part of the world was a disgrace to a Christian country, I knew this house was a godsend. I am going to start a school in that barn next door. And you are going to help me. I couldn't teach those children. I couldn't. They smell. If we'd never been taught to wash, so would we. As for you, Mr. Jones... I'm a solicitor's clerk in Guinegown. I earn 33 shillings a week. I'll give you 34 and your lunch. My uncle left me a little money as well as this house, and I know exactly what I'm going to do with it. But those children in the mine earn money. How can they... I'll pay their parents a few miserable pennies they get out of it. And when I've finished with you, Miss Farnbury, you won't have time to think about snapping up a husband, and you, Mr. Jones, won't have time to be so pleased that you're saved. Well, I do not care if you are not chapel. I am with you. Good. Now, sit down. I'll tell you exactly what I have in mind. I, I disturb your supper, Miss Moffat. But the carpenter is at the back door about the barn. And the boys for the evening class. They're in the yard. Did they write their essay? I don't know, Miss Moffat. One of them has a bottle of rum. <sighs> I'll take care of them. Never mind my tea, Mrs. Watty. They are the same boys I enrolled last night. They have only come to make sport again. Ain't you going to finish your supper, ma'am? Later, Watty, later. She's a clinker, that's what. A clinker? Miss Moffat is a very unusual woman, Mrs. Watty. Terrible strong-willed, of course, terrible. Get her into mischief, I keep telling her. Well, bring me and Bessie here. I said, no, I said. Not to my past, I said. Your past? Before she took me up. But what for there? And now I've joined the corpse. It's all blotted out. The corpse? The militant righteous religious corpse. Ran into them in the street. I did singing and praying and collecting poor blood. I've been a different woman ever since. What do you say? Yes, I am. So am I. Ain't it lovely? But, uh, but what was your past? Right fingers. Stealing? Everywhere I went. Terrible. All right, Bessie, come here and clear the table before I give you a clap. And the first thing you boys will do is go to the pump and wash yourselves. This is my home. It's not the coal mine. <laughs> oh, 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 what I said. Yes, miss. Of course. Please, miss. First, can I have a kiss? What did you say? Please, miss. First, can I have a kiss? Of course you can. <laughs> <laughs> Can I oblige anybody else? Very well, then. Just see that you wash. Please, miss. Can I have a smack bottom, too? Good oh, night, my God. Oh, it's you, Mr. Jones. Mom says I must clear the supper dishes. Mr. Jones, is it true the school idea is not going on that well? Who told you that, Missy, dear? We've been here six months now, and nothing's hardly even started. Everything is splendid. Oh, I'm glad. Miss Moffat's been cruel to me, but I don't bear no grudge. Cruel to you? She likes Miss Sweetie. She told me they're bad for me. And it says right on the bag they're very wholesome. Do you like my hair? It's, it's very becoming. You're quite a young lady, Bessie. Oh, yeah? Mr. Jones. Oh, yes, Miss Moffat. The boys, are they still out there? Miss Rondre and I were just talking to the carpenter. Oh, I'm sure I don't understand it at all. He says it's strict orders. He has strict orders not even to discuss the bar. Who gave the order, Miss Moffat? That's what I want to know. Ah, oh, it's been a bit of a day. First, that letter from the squire this morning. No child can be released from the mine. Then, a request from that tavern in the village. A school would interfere with beer drinking. A message from the chapel people to the effect that I am a foreign adventuress with cloven feet. Yes, it has been a bit of a day. Uh, I will go and speak to the boys, Miss Moffat. <laughs> Poor Jonesy. He's terrified of the older ones. So am I. They're so big and black. Oh, dear teacher, remember me? Oh, Miss Moffat, it's Squire Trevorby. Jolly good evening, lady. Would you mind going outside, Squire? I've been knocking and waiting quite a long while before I say come in. Jolly good. 
call again, Claude. Oh, but he's not Mr. Squire. Oh, and just look at me. Oh, excuse me. I shall be a minute. Mr. Trevorby, I'm rather irritable this evening, so unless there's a reason for your visit... Oh, but there is. A certain gent has just been dining with me. Sir Herbert Vesey. Yes? He's decided he has no use for the barn next door. He does not see it as a school, so he must regretfully, etc., etc. Et but he's implied all along he'd be glad to sell it. Then some bigwig must have made him change his mind. Hey, dear Pedagogue? You. Again. Guessed it right off. Not going to have any of this hanky-panky nonsense in my village. Your village? My village. All my life, I've done my level best for them. They call me squire, you know. Term of affection. Jolly touching. Oh, they jabber away in that funny Welsh lingo. We bless their hearts. It's a free country. But putting them up to reading English. Giving them ideas. Well, <laughs> more people like you, you know. And England will be a jolly dangerous place to live in. What's your idea, I say? What's your idea? I am beginning to wonder myself. So, uh... Why don't you take up croquet, Miss Martha? Keep you out of mischief. Oh, the enchanting Miss Ronbury. Squire? Oh, but you're not leaving. Wait a minute. You're the Squire Bountiful, are you? Adored by his contented subjects, intelligent and understanding. I should just like to point out there is a considerable amount of dirt, ignorance, misery, and discontent abroad in this world, and that a good deal of it is due to people like you. Croquet, dear lady. Tatting, proud. You're a stupid, conceited, greedy, good-for-nothing, apple-headed nincompoop, and you can go to blue blazes. I perceive, madam, that you've been drinking. Adieu, Miss Ronbury. Oh, dear. Oh, dear, dear, dear. That was undignified, I know, but I feel better for it. He, uh, he must have given you a cause, I suppose. Oh, he was kindness itself. He merely persuaded Sir Herbert not to lease and not to sell. What? What would you do, Miss Moffat? Sell the house. Take this brainchild of a ridiculous spinster and smother it. And what are these filthy exercise books doing on my desk? Oh, those hooligans outside. They said last night that Mr. Jones had picked them out because they could write English and would I mind my own some dreadful word business. Oh, yes. The essay. How I would spend my holidays. I must have been mad. Listen to this one. If I have ever holiday, I have breakfast in bed and talks, then dinner and a rest, tea, then nothing, then supper, then I talk and I go sleep. From sheer exhaustion, I suppose. Look, this one is illustrated. But what's it supposed to be? A bicycling tour with me in bloomers. Oh. <laughs> Oh, your squire was right, Ron. I've been a stupid, impractical ass, and I can't imagine how I ever... Ha yes, Miss Moffat? Listen to this. <laughs> the mine is dark. If the light come in the mine, the rivers in the mine will run fast with the voice of many women. The walls will fall in, and it will be the end of the world. We just watched at the pump, Miss. Be quiet. So the mine is dark, but when I walk through the, the something shaft, I think, in the dark, I can touch with my hands the leaves on the trees and underneath, where the corn is green. Go on, reading. There is a wind in the shaft, not the carbon monoxide they talk about. It smells like the sea, only like as if the sea had fresh flowers lying about, and that is my holiday. Did you write this? What is the matter with it? Take your cap off. The spelling, deplorable. Mine with two N's and leaves, L-E-F-S. What was it by rights? A V, for one thing. I never heard of no V's, miss. And don't call me miss. Are you not a miss? Yes, I am, but it's not polite. Oh. You say yes, Miss Moffat, or no, Miss Moffat. M-O-F-F-A-T. No V's? No V's. Where do you live? In the morning, Miss uh, Moffat. Four miles from here. How big is it? Four houses and a beer house. Have you any hobbies? Oh, yes. What? This, Miss. Rum. Put the bottle away. Do you live with your parents? No, by my own self. My mother is dead and my father and my four big brothers was in the big shaft accident when I was ten years. 
Killed? Oh, yes. Everybody was. Who taught you to read and write? Taught? Taught. The verb, to teach. Oh, teached. Who taught you? I did. Why? I don't know. Can I go now? No. Do you want to learn any more? No, thank you. Why not? The others would have a good laugh. I see. Have you ever written anything before this exercise? No. Why not? Nobody never asked me. What is the matter with it? Nothing's the matter with it. It shows you may be very clever. Oh. Have you ever been told that before? It is news to me. What effect does that news have on you? It is a bit sudden. It makes me feel that that I want to know what is behind of all them books here. Can you come tomorrow, five o'clock? Oh, not before seven, miss. Six miles to walk. Seven, then. That will be all. Good night. Good night, Miss Moffat. Are you the one I spanked? I am the one, Miss Moffat. Miss Rombley, Mr. Jones, come in here. Yes? Oh, I've been such a fool. It doesn't matter about the barn next door. We'll start the school here, here in this room. Hang the squire. I'm going to get those boys out of that mine if I have to bat my face and fetch them up from the pit myself. Ring the bell, Mr. Jones. The bell, Miss Moffat? Ring it. I want the squire to hear it clear to Trevor Bay Hall. And when I walk in the dark, I can touch with my hands. Where the corn is green. Before our stars return with Act Two of The Corn is Green, here's Libby Collins, our Hollywood reporter, who has been stargazing. And discovered the most wonderful new star, John. Of course, it was really Howard Hughes who discovered her. Vacationing with friends three years ago. He can pick a winner, all right. She's an exotic beauty. New Orleans born, California educated. When the fans see lovely Faith Dumerg and where danger lives, they'll go wild. A story full of suspense, isn't it? Oh, it's terrific. And the end is super dramatic. Robert Mitchum threw himself into the part so literally, he refused a double for a dangerous fall down four flights of stairs. I understand Faith has a pretty strenuous role for a newcomer in Where Danger Lives. She certainly has. Her role takes her from fashionable life in San Francisco to a fourth-rate hotel in New Mexico. In one scene, which took three weeks to shoot, she wore the same simple cardigan blouse every day. But do you know, Lux Flakes kept it so fresh you'd think the wardrobe department gave her a new one every day. You can depend on Lux Flakes to keep washables nice as new. Well, Faith is just as enthusiastic about Lux Flakes for her own wardrobe. She loves solid colors dramatized with an exotic belt or scarf or earring. Naturally, it's important to her to keep the colors true. She insists on Lux Flakes for everything in her wardrobe that's washable at all. There's no safer care for colors. Wrong washing methods fade colors far too quickly. In test after test, identical colors and fabrics stayed lovely up to three times as long when they were washed with gentle Lux Flakes. You can see why so many Hollywood stars... Make Lux Flakes care the rule for all their nice washables. And a wise rule for girls everywhere. Use Lux Flakes to give your washable cottons and rayons that lovely Lux look all summer long. Act two of The Corn is Green, starring Olivia de Havilland as Miss Moffat and Richard Basehart as Morgan Evans. years have gone by. Miss Moffat's school has become an accepted part of the little Welsh village, though still without the blessing of the squire. And the most promising student is the young coal miner, Morgan Evans. I have my history summation, Miss Moffat. Yes, nine pages, and I told you six. Oh, and for heaven's sake, Evans, watch your spelling. Yes, Miss Moffat. Have you got those lines of Voltaire? I, I think so, Miss Moffat. Then go for your walk now. Good and brisk can be back in an hour. Yes, Miss Moffat. I'll expect you to have that road here by heart, you know. And take your pen from behind your ear. Sit up and beg, Evans. Turn a somersault. Shut up. Shut up or I'll knock your block off. Let me along, Bessie. Miss Moffat, all this ordering you about. I got eyes in my head if she hasn't. And I think you're getting sick of it. Am I? And what else do you think? 
I think that when she tells you to take a walk, you don't take a walk. I think you stop in the village regular every afternoon, standing up at the bar drinking rum. Right, aren't you? Well, why don't you tell her then? Because that's just where I'm going now. <laughs> Four o'clock, Miss Moffat. No sign of Morgan. I sent him for a walk, Mr. Jones. Brush the cobwebs from his mind and give him the chance to memorize his Voltaire. Oh, I hope he's not going to be slow at French. Two years ago, he scarcely knew English. That's the wonder of it, Miss Rombray. Morgan Evans has the most brilliantly receptive mind I've ever come across. Don't tell him so, but he... Is that you, Bessie? I thought you were in your room studying. I don't feel good. Poor Bessie, come here, dear. It's always sitting down, Miss Rombury, studying at a desk. For two years now. I heard it ends and everything rotten away. What's rotten away? Oh. Uh, Bessie said she's been sitting down for two years. She's lucky. What are these letters, Ron? More bills, I fear. Oh, the new desks. And that suit for Evans. Oh. Well, I'll sell a couple more shares of stock. Oh, not again. Why not? It's easy to... Oh. Let's see, Watty, now, just what is this dying duck business? All these lessons are bad for my insides. What's the matter with your inside? It goes round and round through sitting down. There is nothing to prevent you from going for walks between lessons. You can go for one now to the post office. Well? Well, go, please. I'm not going. What did you say? I'm not going. Everybody's against me. Betsy, you're going upstairs. And next week, you're going to leave this house and go to work. Mother, out the window, look. The squire's carriage, the squire. Then he has come. Oh, it is the squire. But he hasn't been here since that dreadful evening two years ago. I behaved more stupidly that night than I ever have in my life. And that's saying something. Now run, both of you. But why is he here? All I can tell you is that it has to do with Evans, and it's vital I make the right impression. What sort of an impression? Helpless and clinging, of course. Oh, quickly, Ron. Just, just disappear. Squire, how wonderfully kind of you to stop by. Well, you wrote me a note, you know. Not here to be insulted again, though. Call me an addle-headed nincompoop, you know. How could you ever forgive me? Who knows I have. Do tell me, Squire, how did your prize winning fare at the croquet this afternoon? Rather a bore, you know. But I heard you made such an amusing speech. Oh, did they tell you about that? Rather a good pal, eh? <laughs> Thought Griffith the butcher was going to laugh his fool death for all. Do you know, that makes me rather proud. Proud? Why? Because Griffith the butcher would not have understood a word if his little girls hadn't learned English here at my school. Oh, never thought of that. Oh. Headache. Squire, you see before you a tired woman. We live and learn. And I have learned how right you were that night. But I... I heard you're a spiffing success here. Oh, no. You see, in one's womanly enthusiasm, one forgets that the qualities vital to success are intelligence, courage, and authority. In short, the qualities of a man. Oh, come, come. After all, I meant well, I suppose. Oh, it's so kind of you to say that. And I have no right to burden you. But you see, my problem is one of your younger tenants. One of your former miners. Giving you trouble, eh? What have you been up to? Poaching? Oh, no. Bit of muslin? Little cockney filly proud? Bessie Watty? Oh, no, I assure you. No, the problem is just Morgan Evans himself. And like a true woman, I have to scream to you for help. Scream away, dear lady. Scream away. <laughs> well, he's clever. To begin with, he can write. He was born with very exceptional gifts, and they must be... They ought to be given every chance. You mean he might turn into a literary bloke? He might, yes. Oh, I'm bloke. How'd you know? By his work, it's very good. How'd you know it's good? Well, how does one know Shakespeare's good? Shakespeare? What's he got to do with that? Well, he was a literary bloke, too. This young tenant of yours has it in him to bring great credit to you. Imagine if you could say that you had known, well, say, Shakespeare, 
That's a boy on your estate. Oh, well, a lot of luck, what? Just look in this book, Squire. The inscription. To the right honorable Earl of Southampton. Your honors in all duty. William Shakespeare. Uh-huh. I often think of the pride that surged in the Earl's bosom when his encouragement to Shakespeare gave birth to the masterpiece of a poor and humble writer. Funny. Never thought of Shakespeare being poor somehow. Uh, if this boy is really clever, uh, pity for me not to do something about it, huh? A great pity. And I can tell you exactly how you can do something about it. Buzz on, dear teacher, buzz. <laughs> well, there's a scholarship open. A scholarship to Oxford. Oxford? They've agreed to allow Morgan Evans to compete on one condition. That you vouch for him. My dear lady, you take the cake. Oxford? Can't he be just as clever at home? No, he can't. For the sort of future he could have, the background of the university is absolutely essential. It's a varsity, you hang it all. He, he'll never get it. I know, but he must have the chance. Still, the mere prospect of one of my minors... Think of Shakespeare, Squire. The Earl. All serene, dear lady, all serene. I'll drop a line to those Oxford chaps next week. Rather a lark, what? Well, I must be off. Well, I should be most obliged if you wrote the letter tomorrow. Would you like me to draft a recommendation? You must be so busy with so many other things. I am, rather. Polka supper tomorrow night, you know. <laughs> yes, do that. Oh, goodbye, dear lady. Thank you so very much, Squire. Happier conditions and all that. Glad you've come to your senses. <laughs> goodbye. Goodbye. Miracle be nice. Well, Ron, that man is so stupid, it sits on his head like a halo. What happened? In five minutes, I have given the squire the impression that he spends his whole time fostering genius and the illiterate. I'm entering our pit pony for a scholarship, Ron. Oxford. Hallelujah. <laughs> Miss Moffat. Oh, come in, Evans. Well, I'm starting you on Greek next Monday. Greek? You'll need it. I'm putting you in for a scholarship at Oxford. Oxford? Where the lords go? The same. Oh, and this is the nail file I mentioned. I'll show you how to use it. I shall not need Greek or a nail file in the coal mine. In the coal mine? I am going back to the mine. I do not want to learn Greek, nor to pronounce any long English words, nor to keep my hands clean. What's the matter with you? Why not? Because... Because I was born in a Welsh hayfield when my mother was helping with the harvest. And I've always lived in a house with no stairs, only a ladder, and no water. And until my brothers was killed, I never sleep except three in a bed. I know that is terrible grammar, but it is true. What on earth has three in a bed got to do with learning Greek? It has a lot. Trying to better myself. You cannot take a nail file in a public bar, Miss Moffat. I never heard anything so ridiculous. Besides, you don't go to a public bar. Yes, I do. I have been there every afternoon for a week, spending your pocket money. I've been there now. I had no idea you felt like this. Because you are not interested in me. Not interested in you? How can you be interested in a machine that you put a penny in and if nothing comes out, you give it a shake? Evans, write me an essay. Evans, get up and bow. Evans, what's a subjunctive? Do you know what they call me in the village now? Kibakura school. The school teacher's little dog. What has it got to do with you if my nails are dirty? Mind your own business. I never meant you to know this. I have spent money on you. I don't mind that. Money should be spent. But time is different. When you're as old as I am, two years is valuable currency. I have spent two years on you. Ever since that first day, the mainspring of this school has been your career. Sometimes, in the middle of the night, when I have been desperately tired, I have lain awake making plans, large and small, sensible and silly, plans for you. And you tell me I have no interest in you. If I say any more, I shall start to cry, and I haven't cried since I was younger than you are, and I'd never forgive you for that. I'm going for a walk. I don't like this sort of conversation. If you want to go on, be at school tomorrow. If not, don't. I don't want your money, and I don't want your time. 
I don't want to be thankful to no strange woman for anything. I don't understand you. I don't understand you at all. So Miss Moffat has gone for a walk. I said so, Miss Moffat has gone for a walk. I don't feel like talking. I heard you, you and her. Mind your own business. I won't. I like to know about everything. I like doing all the things I like. I'm going away soon. Miss Moffat's sending me away. Why? Will you miss me, Morgan? I don't know. Maybe. You know, you was quite right to put her in a place. Clever chap like you. Learning lessons off a woman. That's right. You don't have to go to Oxford. Clever chap like you. That's right. What a man wants is a bit of sympathy. Come here. Yes, Morgan? Come here. Just think, Mrs. Watty, just think. The morning we've waited for has come. This morning, Morgan Evans takes the entrance examination for Oxford. Oh, what if he'd gone back to the mine last autumn after that dreadful scene with Miss Moffat? Oh, it was a rum, Miss, just a rum. Oh, dear me, the squire should be here by now. What's the squire coming for? To invigilate, of course. What was that, please, Miss? Uh, the university appointed the squire, Miss Moffat, to watch him while he's taking the examination. So he cannot cheat. What a shame. <laughs> oh, I, I almost forgot. For you, Mrs. Watty, a card from Betsy. Oh, er, uh, again. But do you not miss her, Mrs. Watty? No. I don't like her, you know. Never have. But your own daughter. I know, but I've never been able to take to her. First time I might for her, I said no. Well, stop snowing, Ron. You ought to be here soon, Morgan and the Squire. Oh, Miss Moffat, would it not be splendid if he won? Not very likely, I'm afraid. Two years isn't enough, Ron. Not even for him. He'll have strong candidates against him. Boys from good schools. It all depends on how much the examiners will appreciate a highly original intelligence. But wouldn't it be exciting? It would be a wonderful thing for him. It would be a wonderful thing for rural education all over the country. And most of all, it would be a wonderful thing for you. I know every trick and twist of that brain of his. Exactly where it will falter and where it will gallop ahead. And yet, not to know him at all. I woke up in the middle of the night thinking about Henry VIII. I have a feeling there may be a question about the old boy and the papacy. I'd better cram one or two packs into him before he starts. Oh, he must win it. He must. Miss Moffat. Yes, Mr. Jones? She's come back, Miss Moffat. Betsy, she's here. Aren't I, Dal? Oh, but it cannot be you. Your mother just received a card. Well, Betsy, this is unexpected. Isn't it just... Your mother's in the kitchen. Who's there to see Mum? Then why are you here? Questions and answers, just like school again. It's you I've come to see. Perhaps we had better retire to the study, Miss Ronberry. Oh, 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 yes, of course. I can give you exactly one minute of my time. Why? Morgan Evans is sitting for his Oxford examination this morning. Well, he needn't. He won't ever be going to Oxford. And why not? Because there's going to be a little stranger. I'm going to have a little stranger. You're lying. If you don't believe it's Morgan Evans, you just ask him. Ask him about that time you locked me up. The night you had words with him. Oh. Ordering him about as if he has no human feelings. You just ask him. I see. Why couldn't I have seen before? Does he know? I've come to tell him. And he'll have to marry me, of course, or I'll show him up. After all, the little stranger. Stop saying little stranger. If you're going to have a baby, then call it a baby. <laughs> have you told anybody? Mr. Jones is all. The squire's coming up the road with Morgan. I'll wait for him here. For the next three hours, Morgan Evans is not going to be disturbed. You're not going to see him. You can't bully me the way I am. Hasn't sunk in yet, has it? I'm teaching you something, am I? You 
you are going into the kitchen, Bessie, to see your mother. You will then go upstairs, and as soon as the examination is finished, we will talk it all over. When we're a little more calm. He's here. I thought I'd see him. If you try to disobey me, if you attempt to stay in this room or blab to anybody about this before we've had that talk, even to your mother, I shall shall strike you so hard that I shall probably kill you. I mean every word of that. Oh, well, I don't mind. Three hours of go soon enough. Nobody home. Squire, so very sorry. Oh, how kind of you. Such a dreadful day. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Pettigog. Anything for a law. Sit down, Morgan. The questions are in this envelope. Before I break the seal, I have a feeling they may bring up Henry VIII. I've written down a couple of dates. Here, memorize them. Yes, Miss Margaret. Glad it isn't me. Really quite stupid, you know. <laughs> Just don't get exuberant, Morgan. No. Nor illegible. No. But aren't you going to wish my protege good fortune? Good luck. Thank you. Ready? Ready. This is your examination. Yes. Yeah. I go to work. Miss Moffat. Yes? The very first question. Henry VIII. After a brief intermission, we'll resume with Act Three of The Corn is Green. And now, from Gallup, New Mexico, we bring you our producer, William Keeley. An hour ago, I was in one of the most primitive parts of our country, creating the atmosphere of 1865 for my new picture of Frontier Days starring Errol Flynn. Sixty minutes and fifty miles later, I'm back to the comforts and pleasures of the 20th century. Sitting beside me in the studio tonight is one of the hardest working members of my cast for Rocky Mountain, the glamorous Patrice Wymore. I've enjoyed every moment of it, Mr. Keeley. I can hardly wait to get back to the Hollywood to see the rushes when we get back to the Warner lot. Did you see Warner's preview of Bright Leaf before we left Hollywood? Yes, I did. And Gary Cooper was wonderful. Patricia Neal and Lauren Bacall, too. You know... They play such contrasting types. Yes, and speaking of contrast, making a picture here on an Indian reservation must be quite a change for you from dancing on Broadway. Indeed it is. But I'll say this. Lux flakes are just as useful. Every night when we get back to the hotel, I lux my nylons. I've had simply wonderful luck. Not a run, even in my shirtless nylon, since we've been here. Well, we'll probably be here for another six weeks, but I think I can promise you an ample supply of Lux Flakes. I'll remember that promise. Down here, I appreciate Lux Flakes more than ever. The desert sand seems to get into everything. I just couldn't get along without Lux. Thank you, Patrice Wymore, for joining Mr. Keeley tonight. Girls all over the country agree with you that Lux is a must for precious nylons. Strain tests prove that washing stockings with a strong soap or rubbing with cake soap make runs come quickly. But Lux Flakes make nylons last twice as long. You'll find it pays to give all your nice things Lux Flakes care for that lovely Lux look. We pause now for station identification. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> The curtain rises on Act Three of The Corn is Green, starring Olivia de Havilland as Miss Moffat and Richard Basehart as Morgan Evans. It's midsummer now in Glen Sarno, seven months since Morgan Evans took the examination for Oxford. Seven months since Bessie Watty suddenly returned and just as suddenly disappeared again without seeing Morgan. All week, Morgan has been far from Glen Sarno, in Oxford, waiting word of his success or failure. How can you be so calm, Mr. Jones? Don't you know the whole village is down at the railway to meet him? It's true. All they talk about is Morgan Evans and the scholarship. But they're not talking of Bessie Bossie and why she came home and went away so quickly again. It does not matter. 
It is more important to know about Morgan. If he hasn't one, it will break her heart. She, she would feel it so keen as all that? I used not to think so, but since this examination day, they've been so much better friends. It has been a pleasure just to hear them conversing. Any news, Mr. Jones? Not yet, Miss Moffat. I thought not. Where's the squire? To the railway, miss, with the rest of them. You do not appear nervous. I'm past being nervous, Ron. If he has won, I shan't believe it. Flatly. And, and if he has lost? If he has lost, we must proceed as if nothing has happened. Meantime, Mr. Jones, your report is on your desk. Miss Rondry, Form 2, are waiting for you. Oh, yes, Miss Muffy. If he has lost. Morgan. I knew they would be all be watching for me, so I got off at Lon Morford. Does that mean? I have no news, one way or another. Except I am no longer hopeful. Why not? <laughs> they talked to me for hours. Oral examinations. They jumped down hard on the New Testament, as you said they would. You are very pale. Better than a raging fever. Go on. I spent ten minutes explaining why St. Paul sailed from a town 300 miles inland. Oh, dear. And the French? Not good. I said naturellement to everything, but it did not fit every time. Did the president send for you? He did. He asked me if I had ever had strong drink. I, I looked him straight in the eye and said no. Oh. <laughs> I was terrible, but terribly nervous. My collar flew open. He did not seem impressed with me at all. Then, as I was leaving, he appeared to be sorry for me in some way, and I received the impression that I had failed. When shall we know? Today, tomorrow, the next day. They will send you the word. Fail. I, I cannot even talk about it. But we must talk about it. You faced the idea of failure the day you left for Oxford. But now I have been to Oxford and come back. Come back from the world. Since the day I was born, I have been a prisoner behind a stone wall, and now somebody has given me a leg up to look at the other side. They cannot drag me back again. They cannot. They must give me a push and send me over. I've never heard you talk so much since I've known you. Well, that's just it. I can talk now. The three days I have been there, I've been talking my head off. My second night there, I took a walk. There was a moon up. Not the same moon I have seen here. A different face altogether. All of a sudden, with one big rush against that moon, I saw this place again. You and I sitting here studying. And all those books and everything I have ever learned from those books and from you was lighted up like, like a magic lantern. Rome, Greece, Shakespeare, Carlyle, Milton, everything had a meaning because I was in a new world. And so it came to me why you had worked like a slave to make me ready for this scholarship. I have finished. I didn't want you to stop. I had not been drinking, Miss Moffat. I know. I can talk to you, too, now. Yes. I'm glad. I tell you, Jones, I'm finding this waiting a definite strain. Telling the lad they'll send the result through the post. Where is he? Still eating? And Miss Moffat says... Please, no questions till he is through. Whenever that will be, the young man will starve to... Hello. Bessie, yes, just as I feel. Oh, how do you do? And how are you, Squire? Blooming? Well, well what the deuce? Bessie. Bessie Marty. Three days ago, she sent money to you. Did you not receive the letter? Yes, I did, and all the others till I was sick of them. What is all this? I'm here to congratulate a certain young gent in case he's won that scholarship. No, no. But what has that got to do with you? You see, Miss Ronberry, it's like this. Don't say it. Don't say it. Four weeks ago yesterday, I had a baby. You had a what? <laughs> baby. Seven pounds, nine ounces. Good heavens, how ghastly. Just me <laughs> And I've just turned it up. Bessie. Hello, Mum. Ma, you do look a dolly mop. Now, where have you been all these months? I'm doing what, I'd like to know. Turning you into a granny. 
She's coming, Miss Moffat. So close the door, Morgan, and have a good sleep. Later we... Hello, Miss Moffat. I've just been telling him, you know what. Now I think it's time you told us who the fellow is. Uh, proceedings, that's what. I'm going to take proceedings. That's right, dear, who is it? Listen to me, Bessie. I'll pay you anything. Anything. It's no good, Miss Moffat. It's Morgan Evans. What? I don't believe it. Oh, ma'am. I've been dreading this for months. In a way, it's a relief. Well, where is he? I got a four-week-old baby, and I haven't got a husband to keep him. I'll call him. There is no need to call him. I am willing to marry her, bestowing on the infant every advantage by bringing it up a Baptist. <laughs> You'd like that, Miss Moffat, wouldn't you? Oh, I'd like to oblige, really, but I couldn't. Besides, my friend would be furious. Your friend? Ever such a nice gentleman, Mum, quite as well. I have never heard such a conversation outside a police car. <laughs> I suppose you wouldn't care to marry me. Good, good question. <laughs> Doesn't that friend of yours want to marry you? Oh, he won't talk to anything else. Only he won't have the baby. So I've got to give up my friend and marry Morgan Evans. Unless Mr. Jones would consider the baby without me. The baby without you? Your own child. What about your mother, love? I haven't got any, didn't you know? <laughs> oh, what a thing to say. I, I cannot remain here another minute. You want Morgan Evans to marry you on the chance he'll become fond enough of the child to ensure its future. Then your conscience will be clear and later you can go off on your own. I shouldn't be surprised, Carl. Meanwhile, it's worthwhile to ruin a boy on the threshold of... Oh, there must be a way out. There must be. Bless us, ma'am. I've got it. What? Why can't you adopt it? Oh, don't be ridiculous. Would that do you, Bessie? Well, I never thought. Would it, though? Yes, yes, it would. But, but what would I do with a baby? I don't even know what they look like. Oh, they're lovely little things. <laughs> now, it's all rain. Stop it. It's, it's fantastic. Oh, do, please. It put everything to rights. He might grow up like his father, you know, and turn out quite nice. But it's... it's mad. Oh, not as mad as taking me in was with my past. But you're the grandmother, Watty. Surely you. Oh, I couldn't. I don't bear it. No, he will. But every penny I get goes to the corpse. You're the one, dear. Really, you are. Bessie Watty, do you mean that if I do not adopt this child... I will have to tell Morgan Evans and he will have to marry me. I swear that. And if I do... I swear you never know a thing about it. Then, I give in. Oh, that's lovely. My friend will be pleased. Well, I'll toddle along then and we'll arrange details later, shall we? I only did it to spite you, you know. Well, that's settled. For which we must be truly thankful. For which we... Morgan. Has she gone? Why? Squire just came by the back way to see me. Oh, the fool. Then it's true. He thought I knew. Then he said it was for the best. That I ought to be told. Oh, why should this happen? There is no need for you to upset yourself. Miss Moffat is going to take care of the... Of what? I'm going to adopt it. And what do you take me for? Then what would you like to do? What would I like to do? It is not a question of what I would like to do. It is what I am going to do. I am going to marry her. And that is final. I knew, I knew. Answer it, Watty. No, no, I'll go. It may be the squire, and I don't want him here. Oh. Oh, thank you. It's a telegram. It's from Oxford. You have won the scholarship, Morgan. Won it. Come on with me, Mr. Jones. I'll make you a nice cup of tea. Come on. Come on. Look at me, Morgan. If ever anybody has stood at the crossroads, you are now. It is no good. I am going to marry her. I'm going to speak to you very simply. I want you to change suddenly from a boy to a man. I understand this is a great shock to you. But I want you to throw off this passionate obstinacy to do the right thing. 
Did you ever promise her marriage? No, never. Did you even tell her that you loved her? No, no. Don't you know that she has her own plans and she doesn't want the child? I am willing to look after it if you behave as I want you to behave. If you marry her, you know what will happen, don't you? You will go back to the mine. In a year, she will have left you both. You will be drinking again, and this time, you will not stop. That does not alter the fact that I have a duty to them both. You mention the word duty, do you? Yes, you have a duty, but it's not to this loose little lady. You mean a duty to you? No. A year ago, I might have said a duty to me, yes. But that night you showed your teeth. You gave me a lot to think about, you know. You caught me unaware, and I gave you the worst possible answer back. I turned sorry for myself and taunted you with ingratitude. I was a fool not to realize that the debt of gratitude is the most humiliating debt of all. That a little show of affection would have wiped it out. I offer you that affection today. Why are you saying this to me now? Because as the moments are passing and I am going to get my way, I know that I am never going to see you again. Never again? But why? If you're not to marry her, it would be madness for you to come in contact with the child. So if I am adopting the child, you can never come to see me. It's common sense. You've been given the push over the wall you asked for. But you... You will be staying here. How can I never come back after everything you have done for me? Every morning, when I take my walk, up there where the valley suddenly drops sheer, you know the place. Yes. I have found myself thinking of you, working for this scholarship and winning it. And I have experienced the feeling of of complete happiness. I shall experience it again. No, Morgan Evans, you have no duty to me. Your only duty is to the world. The world? Now that you're going, there's no harm in telling you something. I don't think you quite realize what your future can become if you give it a chance. You could become a great man of your country. If a light come into the mine, you said, remember? Yes. Make that light come into the mine and someday free these children. And you could be more, much more. You could be a man for a future nation to be proud of. <laughs> Perhaps I'm mad. I don't know. It's up to you. Is it all right to ring the bell, Miss Muffat, to say holiday tomorrow? Yes, ring the bell, Mr. Jones. I think that's all, Morgan. I do not know what to say. I have been so much time in this room. The lessons are over. I... I shall always remember. Will you? Well, I'm glad you think you will. Please, Miss Moffat. Yes, it will. The bind is out, and they say Morgan got to come to town hall. Not in below. Oh, gee, Mom, gee. They never forgive you. Goodbye, Morgan. I... I am so... I cannot talk. Is he gone, miss? Yes. It's all over. Mr. John says, is he to say school day after tomorrow, nine o'clock, same as usual? Yes. calls in a moment. Now, here's Libby Collins with a summer vacation hint. Not about where to go, but what to take, John. You know, Lorraine Day travels a lot, keeping up with her baseball manager husband, Leo DeRocher, and her Hollywood activities. So she's learned how to look glamorous while living out of a suitcase. Her favorite negligee for traveling is deep blue nylon with a net yoke edged with lace. It packs easily and never needs ironing. 
A wonderful traveler. Especially if its traveling companion is Lux Flake. Oh, Lorraine insists on Lux care for all her lingerie. Silk and rayon as well as nylon. And that's smart, because there's no safer care for subtle colors and delicate fabrics. Actual washing tests prove that Lux Flake's care keeps pretty slips and nighties new looking three times as long. It's foolish to take chances with pretty things. Wrong washing methods can fade colors so quickly. Wherever Lorraine goes, Lux Flakes go, too. Why not take Lorraine Day's tip when you travel this summer? Travel light with nylon lingerie and give it Lux Flakes care. At the end of your trip, your lingerie will look as lovely as ever. Get a box of Lux Flakes tomorrow. Wherever you are, all your nice washables <coughs> can have that lovely Lux look. And now... Here's Mr. Keeley with our stars. Our audience is waiting to congratulate our stars on a superb performance. And here they are, Olivia de Havilland and Richard Basehart. <laughs> Olivia de Havilland, in the last few years, has set a record that will stand for a long time in Hollywood. She has received no less than 31 different awards as an outstanding actress. Each one of them has had a special thrill of its own, Bill, and I'm grateful to all those who've helped me to win them. I understand the last award came from Brazil, from the Brazilian Motion Picture Critics. It's terrifico. Well, Dick, Olivia has received national awards and international awards. And I wouldn't be a bit surprised to hear any minute of one from Mars. Perhaps a loving cup on a flying saucer. <laughs> that would be entirely too thrilling, Bill. Do you have any plans for a new picture soon, Mr. Heaven? Well, my immediate plans concern the most wonderful production I know of. My baby. He's going to be christened soon. Well, are we invited? You certainly are. If you can come to San Antonio, Texas, that's where my husband was born and where Ben will be christened. Well, Olivia, I'd love to, but I'm afraid I'll be here in New Mexico working on a picture for quite a while. We still haven't heard about your picture plans, Mr. Haviland. But I think it's always good to have a change of pace. And so I'm looking for a modern love story to do next. Now, I'm sure your fans will enjoy that, Olivia. And now I'll give you two a little award of ours. There's some Lux Flakes in the wings for you to take home. Many thanks. I had instructions not to miss the Lux Flakes. <laughs> but what about next week, Mr. Keeley? What have you planned? Next week, we've selected a gay comedy that's especially appropriate for this time of year. It's Warner Brothers' great laugh hit, John Loves Mary. And we'll have the original stars who made such a charming team, Ronald Reagan and Patricia Neal. Be sure to be listening next week for this grand entertainment. I know everyone will be listening and enjoy it. Good night. Good, Good night. night, and we'll see you next week. There's no more glamorous brunette on the screen than gorgeous Hedy Lamar. One of her greatest charms is her creamy luxe complexion, always so fresh and appealing. Hedy Lamar never neglects her active lather facials with gentle Lux toilet soap. It's a quick, easy care, but it certainly works for me, she says. Leaves my skin just right for camera close-ups. Hedy Lamar's complexion care will work for you, too. Tests by skin specialists prove that in three out of four cases, skin grew lovelier in a short time with daily Lux soap care. Why not put this fragrant white beauty soap on your shopping list tomorrow? Find out for yourself why nine out of ten screen stars use Lux Toilet Soap. <clears throat> Lever Brothers Company, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday evening when the Lux Radio Theater presents Ronald Reagan and Patricia Neal in John Loves Mary. This is William Keeley bidding you good night. Olivia de Havilland is currently starring in the Paramount production, The Heiress. Richard Basehart appeared through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox, producers of Night in the City, starring Gene Tierney and Richard Woodmark. Heard in our cast tonight were Rosalind Yvonne as Mrs. Watty, Rhoda Williams as Bessie, and Herbert Butterfield, Ruth Parrott, Nelson Welch, and Clark Gordon. Our play was adapted by S.H. Barnett, and our music was directed by Louis Silvers. This is your announcer, John Milton Kennedy. Reminding you to join us again next Monday night to hear John Loves Mary, starring Ronald Reagan and Patricia Neal. Stay tuned for My Friend Irma, which follows over these same stations. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>